Um, my name is Brian Sedwix. Um, I, I teach, uh, I'm professional track here at BYU. I'm in the finance department. I teach personal finance. I teach international finance. I teach asset management. I teach modeling and valuation. So I kind of teach the gamut. Um, prior to coming to BYU, I spent 13 years managing assets in the asset class known as emerging markets. So I was a professional money manager. And at our height, I think we managed about 3.2 billion in assets. So we, we were a good little fun. Um, I'm here as part of the you know, investment banking club. I represent the investment banking club. And we invite you to this personal finance boot camp. Um, our purpose here is to help not only investment banking club members, but their spouses to come and to help them as you, as you go out. Help, help them as you try to get their financial houses a little bit more in order. Help you to make the decisions and the goals right now that will make a difference in your lives. Now, you should have got uh, two packets. One is a little green sheet. Can you, you want to lift up that green sheet? That green sheet, it says seven financial priorities. These are the seven things that we'd like, we will be, over the next three Wednesdays, we will be working on. If you're married, we'd like you and your spouse to work on these goals there. If you're single, we'd like you to start working on those as well. Now, I'm very thankful. Um, when I was in your shoes, um, you know, I was still single. I got my, you know, my tuition refunded from BYU because I graduated with an undergraduate and an MBA and I was still single. But when I was in your shoes, I made many decisions that I kept throughout my married life. Always the most important was that my wife and I saved between 20 and 35 percent of every dollar since college. And because of that discipline there, it's allowed me the luxury to do whatever I want, which includes very expensive habits, including coming back here to be white and teach. So <laughs> the, the, things that, the things that we're teaching are, are important and they're critical. I have seven children. They're all boys except for six. You know, I, I, a month ago, I had two kids on a mission, and my daughter just came back. So I've got a son on a mission. And the things that we're trying to teach are the things that will make a difference. You know, I've had my personal finance class, I've had my three oldest daughters, my two sons-in-laws, and my wife all take the course. That tells you how important it is. I tell my students in my personal finance class, I tell them I have three goals for you. Number one, I want you to feel the spirit. The spirit can be here as we teach. In fact, the spirit is the best teacher. Number two, I want you to know that I care. And I care enough that I'm trying to learn the names of 200 students. Names of where they're from. And number three, I told them my goal was to save them a million dollars over their lifetime. And so I think that's a pretty good finance class they can do. But if I can accomplish those three objectives, I think it's good. And so today, as part of this boot camp, we're going to work on a lot of those same areas. It's a very condensed form, but it's an important, important thing to do. So I also represent a group called Money Wise, Money Wise Worksheets. And uh, money-wise, it's just a number of professionals and uh, credentialized professionals that we get together. And we go into generally a married stakes, and we go and we teach on personal finance. Again, the same six modules. Um, and we go, we generally do about four, four stakes a year. Um, but so I work with them as well. So we're excited to have you come to this boot camp. No, we're not going to make you do push-ups. But we're going to make you do mental calisthenics that I think will be equally challenging. And how important is it what we're talking about? Kim Smith and uh, Taylor Nadal and I were talking, and we were commenting, uh, Kim was talking about someone in this ward where the, the wife has to ask the husband for finances. If she needs any money, he asks her, and then he gets to decide whether she gets any money like that. And I, you know, uh, it's funny, Taylor and I both commented. <laughs> so that's different. He says, in our families, it's different. I said, we have to ask our wives for the money. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the point is, is we understand that. No wife should have to ask her husband for money. They're equal partners. And hopefully today we'll give you some ideas and some thoughts here. So, let's start. So thank you for coming. Thank you for spending an evening with us. And hopefully we can, we may not be able to save you a million bucks, but hopefully we can save you some money for the time here. So who, uh, who are planning? I, again, unpaid, credentialized pro professionals. You know, I've got, my, I've got my PhD, I've got my CFA, so I, I think I'm probably qualified to teach these. Um, we have nothing for sale. Everything that we have is free. It's all on the website. So, we, like I said, videos, the documents we use, the PowerPoints, 
Uh, you can even read my class summaries of everything here. Our goal is really to help you become financially self-reliant so you and your spouse can, can accomplish the missions that you're sent here on earth for and really to help you to, to bless and to serve others. What do we ask of you? We'd ask of you to stay the whole session today. There's two sessions today. We should be done somewhere around 8.30. We ask you to give us your next three Wednesday nights tonight and two more Wednesday nights. So three Wednesday nights total. We ask you to share what you learn with others. Our purpose in helping you is not just to teach you, it's teaching teachers so you can go out. And then provide us with suggestions and feedback. At the end of this time, we hope you'll give us some ideas on what we can do to do better to, to, to share this with you. So here's our, our schedule tonight. We're evening number one. I'm going to be addressing understanding financial principles, setting priorities. So we're going to talk about communication. We're going to talk about budgeting. We're going to talk about um, communications and budgeting. Uh, after that, we're going to do financial freedom, living beneath your means. We're talking about spending and a little bit on saving and some other things there. Next week, we've got uh, Steve Felstead from DMBA. He's a CFP. He works for the church. Um, he's going to be coming talking about saving and investing. Uh, Road to financial independence. We have a CPA who's working with us who's going to come and talk about tax and long-term priming. And then on uh, two weeks from today, we've got Jacob Sabrowski, a professor of personal finance at UVU. He's also a BYU grad and a good friend of mine. He'll be coming teaching that. So you'll be taught from a number of very good people. Um, in addition, one of the neat things is as the students in my uh, personal finance and uh, MBA 620 class, they're here to, to work as mentors. Can I have you please stand up, 620, 418 students? So you can see we've got a lot of students here. I'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then for, for 15 minutes, they're going to walk around and just answer any questions that they have. Sometimes it's a lot easier to listen. I mean, they have similar experiences to what you're going through right now, so we encourage you to, to utilize them. So just. Just look for a, la a blue lanyard with a personal finance uh, mentor, and they will be wonderful supports for you. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about understand perspective, talk about set priorities, communicate clearly, and budget well. And so when you talk about understand perspective, our perspective is simple. Our perspective is this. Personal finance is simply part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's part of being a good Christian. Now that perspective has some very important implications. Implications such if it's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then when it comes when the prophet tells us to live on a budget, all of a sudden it no longer becomes a question of money, it becomes a question of faith. I went to a conference last year in Charleston. And I had someone ask me, and he said, Mr. Brother Sutter, he said, Brother Sutter, he said, Professor Sutter, he says, you're from a faith-based institution. What do you differently, do differently than we do at our institution? He said, actually said, what can you do differently? And I thought for a minute, and I said, you know what? Instead of just saying it's a good idea to live on a budget, I said, we talk about what the prophets and the apostles have said. And I says, and it takes it from a question of being a question of money there being a question of faith. And this professor, this older gentleman, he thought for a minute, he says, you know what? He says, you have a bigger hammer. And he's right. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a bigger hammer. I was reading this about from uh, President Uthor. He says, we all have lists of what we could do and should do in our priesthood responsibilities. But what is important in our work, and we need to attend to it, but it's in the why, I, I that should say it priesthood service that we discover the fire, passion, and power. The what of priesthood service teaches us what to do, the why inspires our soul. The what informs, but the why transforms. Have you ever thought about what's, why does the Lord have us learn personal finance? Let me just change this. Now watch this. The what of personal finance teaches us what to do, the why inspires our soul. The what informs, but the why transforms. Why do we need, why did the Lord give us this experience called personal finance? Thoughts? Yes? If done correctly, it's one of, finance is one of the top reasons for divorce. If done correctly, finance is one of the top reasons for the divorce. And it allows us to keep our families together. 
Other reasons? Yes? So discipleship is connected through discipline. As we, if we discipline ourselves in our budget, it can help us in other areas. Yes? It's a matter of being good stewards. It's a matter of being good stewards. Other thoughts? Yes? Uh, yeah. So providing for Deborah. ourselves, uh, budgeting for ourselves will allow us to help serve others. Budgeting for ourselves will allow us to help others. President Tanner said, he said you can't. He says you can't give from an empty purse. You can't give uh, food from an empty shelf. You can't spirit, give um, spiritual encouragement from the spiritually weak. So if we don't, if we are not doing these things themselves, as ourselves, we can't help others. Does it give you a little bit more confidence that I, I live the principles that I teach? And, and I do. And you know, the neat thing is I follow these principles and I see the blessings. My son's on, I have seven children. Their educations are paid for, their missions are paid for. Six daughters, the weddings are already paid for. We've, we've got the money in, a, in, a, uh, in accounts for. Does that give me, do, do I feel peace of mind? And the answer is yes. Let me share a couple of thoughts that I think, what are the whys? I, I believe there's four whys. You know, it's interesting, if all we wanted to do was the math, you wouldn't have to come here. If all you wanted to do was the math, the personal finance, all you do is you go up to the website and you download the spreadsheets, and then you just put all your budgets in and no one would ever have any problems. But what's the problem with the math? Is the math the easy part or the hard part of personal finance? It's the easy part. The hard part is the personal side. And I think if we understand this, it, we can take it more personal. Number one, personal finance will teach us the lessons that we need to return and live with our Savior. It will bring us to Christ. Think about patience. Think about love. Think about charity. All of these things. If all things denote there is a God and His purpose is to bring the immortality and the eternal life of man, the purpose of personal finance is really just to bring us to Christ. Number two, I think personal finance, the why is to help us to learn that, and learn the things we need to, to prepare for and accomplish our divine missions for which we're sent here on earth. We all know we each have a divine mission. There's a reason for us to be here. And personal finance can help us accomplish that mission. Number three, the most important thing, it will help us return, if done correctly, it will help us return with our families back to our Savior's presence. And number four, as it was expressed, it will help us become wise stewards over the things that, that we are blessed with. Now, there's a couple of principles that I think we need to understand. This perspective is an important perspective, but it's based on three important principles. The first principle is this. It's called ownership. I believe everything we have is the Lord's. Question, can you have pride in your buddy's car? Can you have pride in your neighbor's education? If you take away ownership, does it take away the need? Does it take away pride? And is pride one of the major, major sins? But if we truly believe that everything was the Lord as the scriptures say, would we handle our money differently? So we're, we're not owners over the things that we have. We're not owners over the things that we've been blessed with. What are we then? We're not owners for what? We're stewards. <clears throat> Notice it's expedient that I, the Lord, should make every mount accountable as a steward over earthly blessings, which I have made and prepared. But along with the stewardship, what's the final one? We stole it from the Young Women's Program. <laughs> Accountability. I believe we will be held accountable. We know from the scriptures we'll be held accountable for our thoughts and our words and our actions. If you want to have a scary thought, I believe we will be held accountable for every dollar that goes to our head. And the Lord's going to ask for a stewardship. Does that make it more personal? I hope it does. And if we can put it in that perspective that all these things are His, the purpose is to bring us to Christ, to help us accomplish our missions, then all of a sudden, it's not a question of money anymore. 
And it's a question that Heavenly Father wants us to do. And because he wants us to do it, he will help us to accomplish it. Many of you have seen this, but I'd like to show it anyway. To provide providently, we must practice the principle of provident living. Joyfully living within our means. Being content with what we have. Avoiding excessive debt. Sorry, I hit a button. I won't touch it. To provide providently, we must practice the principle of provident living. Joyfully living within our means. Being content with what we have. Avoiding excessive debt. And diligently saving and preparing for a rainy day emergencies. May I share with you blessings in provident living that can help each of us. When we were newly wedded, I was in the Air Force, and we had missed Christmas together. When I got home, I saw a beautiful dress in a store window and suggested to my wife that if she liked it, we would buy it. Mary went into the dressing room of the store. After a moment, the sales clerk came out, rushed by me, returned the dress to its place in the store window. I said, what happened? She replied, it was a beautiful dress, but we can't afford it. Whenever we want to experience or possess something that will impact us or our resources, we may want to ask ourselves, is this benefit temporary or will it have eternal value and significance? Truthfully answering these questions may help us avoid excessive debt and other addictive behavior. When we are addicted, we seek those worldly possessions or physical pleasures that seem to entice us. But as a child of God, our deepest hunger and what we should be seeking for is what the Lord alone can provide, His love, his sense of worth, his security, his confidence, his hope in the future. I invite you to come unto him and to hear his words when he said, Wherefore, do not spend money for that which is of no worth, nor your labor for that which cannot satisfy. May each of us also overcome worldly temptation by coming unto him and becoming provident providers, both temporally and spiritually, for ourselves and others, is my humble prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Isn't it interesting called debt and other addictions? I always get kind of chill when he says that, because it is an addiction. And it's something we need to be very careful about. Second thing we want to talk about today is we want to talk about set priorities. What do you want out of life? I like what Clayton Christensen talks about. He says, how will you measure your life? In that article, how many people have read that article? I would encourage everyone to read that. And you say the way to measure with your life is how, you know, how tall you stand when you stand on your wallet? Or she who has the most toys wins? The most clothes wins? How did he say how we measure our lives? It wasn't with our families. It wasn't the service and the things that we do. So what do you really want out of life? In this, this boot camp, we have seven priorities we would like to work on over these three weeks. Number one, communicate clearly. Pay tithes and offerings. Use a budget. Avoid debt. Build a reserve. Teach family members and prepare for emergencies. These are kind of the priorities. Now, in this boot camp, what we're going to do is we're really probably just going to pique your interest. We'll give you enough to, to help you to make some good decisions, but we encourage you to study more and read on your own and find more. Uh, on this website, in addition to the PowerPoints and all the other things, there's a number of learning tools that can help you. So, but these are kind of the frameworks that we have. And today, on that green sheet, we'll give you a little bit of time that we're, we're going to work with three or four of those. Um, Three of the four of those priorities. Other topics, you know, how about family? Charitable giving. 
business, recreation, allowances. Saving for your own mission, saving for a big purchase, goods and services. There's a lot of variants that we're, what we're talking about today covers. And so what we want to do is just kind of, again, give you some basic information on that. We talked with a number of bishops. And again, I'm at a bishopric, uh, I'm at the foreign language student residence. So here, just up by the MTC. Talk with a number of bishops. And would you like to know the things that the bishop said? These are the things that they wanted you to know. Learn how to live on a budget. Don't expect to have everything right now. And don't do, blow through large amounts of cash. You can read that. But these are the things that are important. These are the things that the bishops have said. And so, I think if you, you will come and you'll spend time with us, we will address a lot of these issues here. Okay, communicate clearly. It's interesting. What's the most topic that, that people argue the most, couples argue the most about? It was money. Most couples agree in every marriage, money eventually becomes the most important concern. Why do you think that's the case? <coughs> and what can we do to make it, to, to eliminate that problem? And marriage is a challenge. You got two people doing totally different things and you come together. But the key is if we can if we can do it from a very personal side, from the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can do so much better at this. Share another one. Das hier ist ein Mindset. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gewinn des Wüsten Wester. Das gilt das Überlebens Rana. And the reason I think my kids are good missionaries is from the time that they were free, 
or four or five, they've been out at Nauvoo talking to people and trying to get, get referrals. So you need to talk and you need to discuss what are the things you each want to accomplish. What are you trying to do with your family? What are you trying to do with your kids? And what we want to do is we want to implement processes to help us that we can communicate. And you know what? There's nothing more, nothing harder than talking about money. And if we can talk about money, we can talk almost about anything. And ideally, if we do it before we talk about money, we have a prayer and we pray that we can have the Spirit with us, then it's three people in the discussion. A lot of times we have family baggage. What family rules, explicit or implicit, shape the way you look at things. My wife comes from a family, I come from a family of six boys and one girl. No, I've got six daughters and one son, that's fair. You know. <laughs> but, but she was born differently. She looks at things differently. We all have different ways. You know, we cannot change how we were brought up, but we can change how we're going to raise our children. And so the key is to find that. And the most important thing to do is, how can we be more Christ-like? Different attitudes, the miser, dad paid cash for everything, mom paid the bills, kept the books. We never talked about money. The spender, oh, things will always work. If the shoe fits, buy it in every color. You know what, and what we sleep Oh no, you know, tidings like paying guaranteed income insurance. We're good people, good things will happen to us. This is not the way it works. Do you think the Lord worked this way when he created the earth? Think about the process of creation. You know, we really can't create our own little worlds here, but what can we do to teach us some of the same traits? Is setting goals and then accomplish them, is that the spiritual and then the physical creation? How about living on budgets? Is that the spiritual and the physical creation? Think about the things Heavenly Father is trying to teach us with these things. Okay, let me grab up my, my phone. So we talked about that on that green sheet. What we've got is I'd like you to, to take out that green sheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to take two minutes. And I'd like you to think about if you're married, if you have a spouse here, talk with your spouse. If you're with a group of uh, others, talk about that. What, what could you go, what goals could you set? And I'd like you to set at least one goal. Does everybody here have the sheets? Sheets and the things there. Looks like we could use some here. If there's any extras back there, you can bring those down. But spend two minutes and I'd like you to think and write down at least one goal that you could have on the communication call. So take a couple minutes. It's okay to talk. You know, in my classes, I like when I ask people to talk, I actually like people to hear people talking. I like to see people talk.
Just out of curiosity, someone want to share, if, if you wouldn't mind, someone like to share one of the goals that you've got in this communication area? Anyone be interested? Yes. We have a budget, but not really like, and it's pretty detailed, but we don't really have like a, this is how we're going to achieve this. So okay. we really like the weekly meeting thing where I'll actually say like, this is how we're going to do this. I think that's a great idea, a weekly meeting. And I'd I recommend you set a time, it's, it's at this meeting on Friday nights at, you know, 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock or something like that. Other things, other goals that you have to do with my chair. We only had one company that way. Yes. I was just talking to Mark. Mark's single right now, but I was saying um, one idea is like if you're not married, like we were talking about maybe having somebody that you go to every week um, to talk about and have that financial planning. Yeah. Because I think me right now, I say, okay, when I'm married, I'm, then I'm going to do it like every week and sit down and financially plan. But I think you need to get into that habit maybe even before right. so you can kind of build it up. And you know what? What young, what young person would not like to have their, their future spouse have already gone through this process? They know every week they sit down and they talk to this. What a good preparation. Let's talk about the second one, okay? We're talking about blank. It says every family should have a blank. Why would we not think of going one day without a blank in this church or our business? And one of the successes of the church would have to be that the brethren watch these things very carefully. And we do not spend that which they, we do not have. What's in the blanks? Budget. And budget is not a four-letter word. It's a five-letter word. <laughs> you know what? When I teach budgeting, I teach a little bit different way. The old way to budget was this. Income minus your tithing, minus your expenses, give you available for savings. What's wrong with this? There's never anything left at the end of savings. Now, we teach a different way now. We teach the better way, which is now we have income minus you pay the Lord first. You pay yourself second, and that goes to your goal. And then you pay your expenses, and then you anything left is other savings. Now you've got twice the chance. Why do we pay the Lord first? Isn't it all, all his? Yeah. It is. It's all his. And by putting him first, we show that we love him. We show that we're being obedient. And I like the scripture, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, you have no problems. Do we want the Lord bound to us? And the answer is yes. So, here's our second guideline. Two minutes to talk as a group. What goal would you have here with ties and offerings? Let me just share a story while you're writing it down. I came back from my mission. They called me to be an elder sport instructor. And I remember teaching a lesson on fast offerings. And the lesson was, you know, President Kimball, he said, he says, you know, I encourage you to pay a generous fast offering more, ten times more when you're in a position to do it. He says, I know there's many people who couldn't. And I thought, you know, I can pay ten times more. Ten times nothing is still nothing. <laughs> and I did. From then on out, I paid 10 times my normal number. And then when my wife and I got married, we decided, you know what, it, it would be better. Instead of paying fast offering, and tithing is easy because it's 10%. 10% of your know, increase. Fast offering is harder. I said, well, whoa, how about if we just pay fast offerings in terms of a percent? Much, it's a much less percent. And so we made an agreement you know, that this is what we would do. And then later we went back, I went back and I checked what was my income as a, how much was I giving fast offering as a percent of my income? And it was exactly the same number that my wife and I agreed on. And we, we did that for 20, you know, 20 years until about eight years ago when someone challenged us to double our fast offering. And we doubled it. And you know what we never had. But what goal would you have? What are we doing when we're, do we, are we required, you know, tithing, we have to pay, the scriptures say we're, we're Required to pay tithing at 10%. How about fast offering? Are we under, do we have to, is it the same law there? What do you think? Or are we under a covenantal obligation to take care of the Lord's poor? And I think the answer is, is the last. So let's take a couple, let's take a couple more minutes.
but to write a, a goal there. What goal would you have? For most of you, it's a goal you're already doing. So we went out last night. 
But you know what? Every time with, with seven kids, we have lots of birthdays, and now we have two grandkids too, plus sons and moms. And so these are budgets, these are costs that we need to budget for. And how about Christmas? Is Christmas a scary time? Are we usually paying for our Christmas gifts, you know, up through March or April? Or June or July? You know, what are we doing? So we need to estimate these amounts. How about insurance? You know, I've got a house, and so I've got December household insurance comes up. You know, so what we need to do is use this to figure out when do the irregular payments come through and plan accordingly. Here's some tips. First one, don't drive each other nuts. It can be, realize that we're different people. Realize that when you communicate, one is not in charge. You know, I love the, I love the talk by uh, Elder Wilson, Larry Wilson. Um, and he tells the story about he and his wife, and they were driving down the road. His wife was, had a tendency toward a little bit of a lead foot. And she says, he says, well, you probably should slow down. And she thought, well, what right do you have to tell me to slow down? He thought for a minute, he says, well, I have, I'm your husband, and I have to preach it. He said, I've never made that mistake. <laughs> Just because we have the priest, does that mean the males get to make the decision? There's a common word for that. In DNC 121, it's called unrighteous community. We are equal partners with our spouses. And for the really smart guys like Ken Smith and Ken and Nate and myself, our wives are the ones who are the And I actually, with six daughters, my daughters are, are as good or better than, than anyone I know. So the key is that, that we need to be wives. We understand. We need to understand what the Lord has said. Keep better records. Again, ATM leakage is a big deal. And then we have software. You know, quick at mint.com, other financial software. Mint.com is a wonderful software program. We used to get subsidized copies or cheap copies of Quicken here in my classes. And in, in December, they told us we're not getting those anymore. So we'll probably be moving to mint.com. But what you want to do is find free ways that you can, you can manage your finances. Now, I've got lots of accounts. I've got 529 plans, which are education accounts for seven kids. I've got... Uh, mission accounts for seven kids. I've got education IRA accounts. So the thing that I like about Quicken is it connects to my bank, and it connects to my brokerage house, and it connects to my credit cards and all these places. So on Sundays, before I meet with my wife, we sit down and I push a button, and Quicken brings in all my accounts, all the brokerage, all the checks, all the credit cards, and all of these things here. And then we go through and accept, we categorize every single one. And so in 30 minutes to 45 minutes, we know where we are financially. So, the whole key here is make saving easy. You know, have it automatically come out of your checking account. Have your mutual fund. $100 every week or every month go to your favorite mutual fund account. Make spending hard. So that's kind of the key. So let's give you two minutes. Again, here's the, here is financial planning priority number three. I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes. What goals will you help you to do to help you to be better with your budget? To live on less than you make. So I'll be in a couple of minutes.
walk out of here with no goals, tonight will have been worthless. But if you can walk out of here with at least one or two or three goals in, in a couple of these areas, tonight can be a very important night for you.